And uh, I put in the chat thread, you can see the scriptures. We're going to try to cover seven final words from the cross. Not all of them are uh, technically prayers of Jesus, but they all fit together like a mosaic. So the first reference we'll be in is Matthew 27, verse 46. Hello, Kathy and Jerry. Good to see you. Hi. Thank you. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to mute the Zoom crew here in just a second. And uh, like we've been doing, we'll, we'll sign off on Facebook later in the hour, and then Zoom can stick around and we can address questions and comments and, and check in with each other. That's the incentive for joining via Zoom. <laughs> uh, welcome to all of you. You are now muted on Zoom, and we're going to get started in Matthew chapter 27. So today we have the final of our series on the prayers of Jesus. We began a few weeks back with Jesus teaching his disciples to pray and, of course, giving us the Lord's Prayer. We also saw Jesus uh, praying in thanks in Matthew 11 that the Father has chosen to reveal himself not to the wise and understanding, but to infants. And, uh, and then Jesus goes on from that prayer to welcome the weary and heavy laden to whom he will give rest. We also saw Jesus in John chapter 12 uh, praying, uh, Father, glorify uh, glorify yourself or glorify the Son. And the Father speaks from heaven and says, I have glorified my name and I will uh, do so again. And then we had uh, Jesus in uh, the Last Supper, chapter 17 of John's Gospel, Jesus' uh, long prayer for the disciples and for the church then and to come. And then last week we were in the Garden of Gethsemane on Maundy Thursday, looking at Jesus' agonized prayer in the garden. So now today we finish the series, we're kind of jumping behind Easter Sunday again to spend another, another study uh, at the cross of Christ. So he has the seven final words from the cross, and uh, you find three of them in John's gospel, you find one of them uh, in both Matthew and Mark, and then you find the rest in Luke's gospel. So when you pull them all together, you get what Eugene Peterson calls a prayer mosaic. And not each of these seven final words are technically prayers addressed to the Father, but they do serve as, as a cohesive uh, whole uh, as we not simply look upon Jesus and him crucified, but we uh, are now made to participate uh, in his death uh, and, and not simply participate as people who now belong to him, but as people who are implicated in his crucifixion. For it is for our sins and for our salvation that Christ was put to death. So you're going to hear a lot of Eugene Peterson today. Um, partly that's because uh, I, I was able to spend more time with his resource than a couple of the others I had hoped to get to. Because last night, my, my dear wife woke me up about two in the morning and said, our water heater is leaking all over the basement. And lo and behold, it has rusted out after 14 years. And, uh, and as we speak, Baxter Plumbing is replacing the water heater. So thank God that we do not need to continue our quarantine now with, uh, without hot showers, but it looks like that work is underway. But boy, has that been quite a thing the last few hours. In any event, uh, Eugene Peterson uh, invites us to pray with Jesus from his cross, that we sink our souls into this mystery, he says. Uh, he says we want our death to be congruent with his death uh, so that we would be a witness to the resurrection, not simply his, but our own in him. He talks about how uh, visiting Jesus's death or revisiting the scene of the cross, hearing these seven words, uh, or if we were able, uh, gathering on a Good Friday uh, worship service. When we do this, we're not revisiting his death kind of like we would visit a cemetery and bring flowers to the gray sides of our loved ones, where uh, by doing that, we keep the memory of the deceased uh, and the beloved dead in focus. But here instead, we're not at the cross to pay homage. We are here to probe the meaning of our daily dying in the company of Jesus's dying for us. So we're here to be engaged uh, in his dying prayers, in his dying promises and words. And so Peterson says, we pray in company with Jesus as he prays in his, his death. It is a way of prayer that brings us into an embrace and acceptance of the death we die as we are baptized into Christ and become witnesses to a resurrection in which we, having died, are raised with Christ. 
So as I mentioned, you have to pull from all four gospels to put together the seven last words. And, uh, and so you, then you can have some interpretive license to say, well, which did he say first? Uh, there are some that are clearly earlier or later in the process of his dying. But for today, I'm going to take Eugene Peterson's uh, route through it. And he actually begins here in Matthew 27 with the, uh, the, the agonizing prayer my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I just noticed I copied it from Mark 15 instead of Matthew, but the same basic text is in both Gospels. So I'm in Mark 15, 33, but you'll find it very similar since I told you to go to Matthew 27. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This prayer, no doubt, has echoed through the corridors of the centuries, ricocheting off the walls of our churches and our homes, and for however long or however attentively we listen, we never get an answer to Jesus's question, why? Why have you, the Father, forsaken me? Eugene Peterson asks if it helps us to find ourselves in the company of Jesus as he prays his why. Does it help to find Jesus in our company as we pray our why? Why, oh Lord? Of course, on Mondays, the classes we've been doing have been on the Lament Psalms, and those are uh, one after the other, a prayer to God asking why, or how long, or what now? Does it help to find Jesus praying a lament prayer and a lament song upon his own lips? I think it does. Does it help us to realize that as Jesus was, was praying and, and naming his sense of God's abandonment, does it help us to know that he was praying a prayer that he learned as a child? You know, think about in, in the face of death, how we long for, say, a mother's comfort or for a father's reassurance. And in the face of his death, Jesus prays to his father. He asks why. He names his abandonment, but he also prays to his father. He still addresses his prayers heavenward. And he prays the first line of Psalm 22, which begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22 begins in abandonment, but it concludes in the company of the saints as a witness that God has not, uh, has not forgotten the one who prays, but that God has indeed heard. And so does it help as well as we pray in the company of Jesus to know that the psalm he prays ends differently than it begins? And I think it does. I want to press forward to the second uh, prayer. We could do a week on each of these seven, but we have to continue forward. The second prayer, we're going to go over to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, beginning in the verse, uh, verse 32. Luke 23, 32. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. This is an incredible prayer. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Who are they? Well, we can look at the historical record right off the bat and say they include Caiaphas, the high priest, Pilate, the Roman governor, the soldiers who participated in the flogging and, and the arrest and the crucifixion itself, the leaders of the, the priesthood in Jerusalem, Judas, the betrayer, the 11 disciples who at Jesus' arrest fled in fear, and of course, Peter, who compounded the disciples' abandonment of Jesus by then denying his association with Jesus later on that night. So who is they? They is us. We have seen the enemy and they is us. 
For those of us who choose to pray this prayer of Jesus or pray this prayer with Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is a sobering, sobering prayer. Because don't we insist that justice would be served? Don't we have a duty to see that the law of the land is upheld and, and, and preserved? When we're wronged on a personal basis, uh, do we just lie down and take it? Uh, are, are we supposed to uh, cultivate, cultivate a doormat persona, as Eugene Peterson says? These questions, um, when they remove the forgiveness uh, uh, of Jesus's prayer here, uh, when, they move, re when they remove Christ-like forgiveness from our personal agendas in life, if they succeed in doing that, if they succeed in removing this prayer of Jesus from our daily living, um, these are, Peterson says, questions insinuated into our lives by the devil. And what does he mean by this? What he means is justice matters, but forgiveness matters more. Forgiveness matters for our own soul as well as those of the perpetrators. And forgiveness recognizes that, yes, earthly justice very, very, very often will have to take its own uh, pound of flesh. It will have to bring the matters into its own hands, that there are consequences to law being broken and people do reap what they sow. And for the flourishing of life in the future, there needs to be the protective measures to punish uh, evil. However, forgiveness, forgiveness from the cross is, it is a, a Christ-like posture toward our enemies, specifically those who are putting us to death. And he, for this reason, Eugene Peterson says, such forgiveness is not soft sentimentality. It is hard-edged gospel. It's not a moral shrug of the shoulders. It is a white, hot flame of resurrection love forged in the furnace of the cross. I mean, did Jesus's executors not really know what they were doing? Were they that innocent or oblivious? The second thief, in fact, which becomes a bridge between the second and third words of Jesus from the cross, the second thief uh, turns against the one who was mocking Jesus, and the second thief confesses his own guilt and says, we are justly condemned. We are getting what we deserve, but this one is innocent. So the second thief actually confesses, Jesus, I did know what I was doing, and I do know what I am doing. So we're going to now transition from the second to the third word of Christ from the cross. We're still in Luke chapter 23. One of the criminals hanged there kept deriding Jesus and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, this is incredible. Jesus has, he has heard Jesus pray, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And that prayer evokes a confession of guilt from the thief. He doesn't say, yes, Jesus, I know you're innocent, and you're right. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I got caught up in the circumstances. I, if I had known what would have come of this, I would have chosen better, uh, more wisely. He doesn't do that. He actually even though Jesus has given him a, an out, I don't know what I'm doing. He in fact says, I know what I'm doing and I know that I deserve this condemnation, but I know you are innocent, Jesus. And so Jesus's prayer of forgiveness evokes repentance from this thief. Repentance isn't uh, the, the, um, uh, that which unlocks Jesus's forgiveness, but it is Jesus's forgiveness which unlocks the full confession and repentance of the thief. Jesus, I'm getting what I deserve. Nevertheless, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus now, his third word from the cross is, today I tell you the truth, you will be with me in paradise. This third word is an answered prayer fragment. 
Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. And now Jesus brings the, fa the, the Father's forgiveness into his own promise that he gives to this thief. It's beautiful. Jesus, uh, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them. And the very next thing he says is to this thief, essentially he says, you are forgiven. You will be with me in my kingdom when I come into it. You'll be with me in paradise. A quick word on paradise here. Uh, the, the word really uh, captures a sense of a, of a resting place, of a, of a temporary place uh, awaiting uh, something more. So N.T. Wright is really good on this. Uh, he talks about paradise being, being a garden. And uh, it is uh, life after death is paradise. But the Bible's hope, as it's ex expressed here and in Revelation 20, 21, as in Romans chapter 8 and elsewhere, uh, ultimately, uh, we are concerned with life after life after death, which is to say, not simply escaping the earth, escaping the body, going with Jesus, uh, our spirit floating elsewhere to be in paradise, but we are uh, awaiting the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, the renewing of the creation, the bringing together of heaven and earth like a bride and a groom in eternal union. And so Eugene Peterson points out that this prayer or this promise now for, for paradise is not eternal self-indulgence. Paradise is not eternal self-indulgence. Paradise is where Jesus is. And here's a line that just blew my mind this morning. Eugene Peterson says, eternity is not perpetual future, but perpetual presence. Eternity is not perpetual future, but perpetual presence. Pray through that. Meditate on that for a while. My goodness. When I think of heaven sometimes, you know, you think it goes on and on and on and on forever and ever. Amen. Right? But truly, heaven and the new creation in Christ is not about time going on and on like an ever-flowing stream. It is about God is here, God is here, God is here, God is here. Now the fourth word of Jesus, also from Luke 23. Luke 23, verse 44. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now, you probably notice right away if he says this prayer and then he breathes his last, but we still have three words of Christ from the cross to go. You see, I'm, I'm playing with the chronology of it a little bit. Uh, partly because it's easier for us to stay in the Gospel of Luke and do all three of these words from, from Luke 23. Uh, but in any case, Jesus, the one who had prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The one who prayed, Father, forgive them. Jesus for himself now is praying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. His dying words are of pure childlike trust in the Father's hands. The one forsaken by the Father nevertheless, wholly abandons himself into the Father's care. Peterson says, Jesus was not giving up. He was entering in, entering into the work of salvation in which everything he experienced was being put to the uses of salvation. He was not giving up the ghost. He was entering into the completion of the work of salvation. And for us, in our lives, Eugene Peterson has great pastoral counsel. He says, this prayer is not something we hold in reserve for our deathbed. It is instead a prayer of reluct, uh, excuse me. It is a prayer that we can pray when we get out of bed each morning. Alive yet another day. Ready to go to work or to teach kindergarten on a Zoom conference call. Or to perform surgery or to write a check for college tuition, 
or to plant a field of barley. I mean, whatever, whatever the everyday tasks and vocations bring, Peterson says, we can pray with Jesus, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Now we're going to go over to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. The last three words will all come from John 19, beginning in verse 26. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to his disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. So as part of these seven last words, this certainly doesn't sound like a prayer. Woman, here is your son, here is your mother. But we do know in John 17, at the Last Supper, Jesus had prayed that the disciples would be one, as he and the Father are one. He does pray for the church in its infancy and its church, the, the church as it extends to more and more people. And here is the creation of the church, in a sense. This is, the, this is a, a nucleus of a new community, the community of the, of the beloved. At the cross, we have two different groups of people. We have a group of four soldiers who are casting lots and dividing Jesus' clothes between them. Every man for himself, get what you can get. We also have four women named uh, or one is referred to as, as Mary's relation or rela relative. So while as four soldiers are gambling to get what they can get, four women, along with the beloved disciple, are standing near the cross, and Jesus now forms a new community. He's making them participants in everything involved in his death. Everything. The abandonment that he had prayed, the forgiveness for those who don't know what they're doing, that they had heard him pray. The hope of heaven and paradise he extended in a promise to the thief. The atonement he's accomplishing, the sacrifice, the pain, the thirst, salvation in whole. He makes these four women and the beloved disciple participants. Eugene Peterson says, if we miss these words, here is your son, here is your mother. We risk walking away from the cross with nothing more substantial than a powerful emotion that can be renewed under the right conditions or some secret truth that we can carry around as a talisman. But if we listen, really listen, he says, we will hear something like, take a good look at the one standing next to you. Get to know her, get to know him. Jesus, uh, as I, Jesus, know and am known by them. As a mother knows her son, as a son knows his mother. In other words, the, G, the, the cross of Christ is not a place that we look upon with pity, but a place in which we participate and are implicated both through our own uh, guilt, but also uh, through Jesus's creation of a new community at the cross. We get to know each other. It doesn't, doesn't matter how uh, sheltered we are each to their own home during these days of quarantine. We know each other in Christ like a son knows the mother, like a, son, a mother knows the son. Going on from there to verse 28. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. It's just one word, dipso. I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. This sixth word, from the cross. It's the only prayer, only word from the cross that describes physical agony that Jesus undergoes. He's described abandonment. He's described uh, his desire to, uh, to have the Father forgive those who have done this to him. But this is the one prayer that really uh, gives us a glimpse into the physical pain, the thirst of the cross and of his dying process. And this, for John's gospel, as we were learning on Sunday mornings for a while and then finished up on a Monday online, in, the, in John's gospel, wine and thirst has come up before. At a wedding in Cana, in John chapter 2, the wine had run out before the wedding reception had run out. 
And this is a great shame to the host and to all the guests. But Jesus, uh, when nudged by his mother, uh, instructs the servants to take those barrels of water, or take those empty barrels of wine and to fill them with water. And Jesus now makes wine out of the water so that the wedding feast would be gladdened and it would be the first sign of his glory, the first public miracle John gives us. Now here, fast forward to this next scene where his mother appears at the foot of the cross. And now it's Jesus who thirsts. And instead of making wine for us or instead of receiving wine, he's given the bitter stuff, the vinegar, the gall. He's given something to wet his tongue as he agonizes. Eugene Peterson has strong words about this, um, this glimpse we're get, being given of Jesus's physical agony, of his human suffering, which is to say his human and divine suffering because there is only one Jesus, but the suffering of one who has a body. The strong word is not to turn this into what he calls spiritual pornography. Spiritual pornography looks upon something dramatic, difficult, uh, terrifying, happening to somebody else, and makes out of that a, a spiritual experience. Um, that, bef that, that before we look on Jesus as an, as an object to be pitied, we must hear ourselves and find ourselves involved in his death, uh, in implicated in the cross. That when he thirsts, uh, we must find our own thirst. We must um, we must be made thirsty so that uh, even though Jesus can croak out one, a one word, I thirst, you and I in the face of God's judgment cannot even croak out a single word. That we have nothing to say of these things. Uh, that we, uh, as Paul told the Romans in chapter 3, that our mouths are shut up. Uh, in the face of the cross, at the foot of the cross, we don't have any words to our defense. But again, Jesus, your savior, he drinks the bitter stuff. He, he endures this agony for you and for me. So we are implicated in it, but it, we are recipients of what Jesus is doing here. Now verse 30 in the, uh, the, the seventh word, when Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. This is another one word prayer, to tell us that it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. As in the book of Genesis, when God finished the work that he had done and rested on the seventh day, so here Jesus has finished the work for which he came and will rest over the Sabbath day in the tomb. And on the third day, when he's raised, uh, when he is raised from the dead, now we have the new creation coming into being. That the work of Jesus to save is complete. That the cup of God's wrath has been poured out on his son, the son who willingly laid his life down. And on the third day, Jesus, uh, the one who had said it is finished, when he comes back on the third day, he's not, uh, he's not coming back for vengeance. He's not coming back to take names. He's not coming back to say, it's not finished. I'm alive and watch out. He's coming back to say to his disciples, peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit. And then he goes and sends the disciples in that spirit and with that word of peace to be extended to others. That as we forgive the sins of others, they are forgiven on account of Christ. But that's kind of stealing the thunder for this coming Sunday's sermon. So that's, I'll leave it there. But in John's gospel, Jesus finishes his work on the cross, uh, and he is buried in a garden, in a tomb. And then on the third day, it's in a garden in which Mary and the others encounter the empty tomb, and Mary herself, encountering the risen Christ in the garden, supposes him to be a gardener. But in fact, this is now bringing full circle the story of Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now in this case, it's Mary, who uh, in, in this garden, becomes the first recipient of the new creation in Christ. He says her name, Mary, and she now recognizes her Savior 
and everything has become has been made new. I want to finish with uh, with a little bit more on the word to tell us die, a little bit more on the word finished. Because when Jesus says finished, he meant it. There's nothing left to do. The word to tell us die is sometimes translated with the word perfect in, uh, in, in the New Testament. Most notably in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. I mean, talk about a tall order on that one. Be perfect. But what is perfection according to Jesus? Perfection is not a moral achievement. It's not finally uh, fulfilling the law of God. It's not feeling so bad for Jesus, the thirsty one on the cross, that we finally get our act together and turn our lives around and follow him faithfully. Perfection is not our achievement. Perfection is Christ who has said, perfected, finished, the work I have completed. So to be, perf to, to be perfect is to be perfected, to be made passive recipients of the perfection that is in Christ Jesus. He has become for us righteousness from God and wisdom and sanctification and all the rest. Jesus is our perfection and his work is finished. In other words, we do not have a Jesus and Christianity. Jesus hyphen and then you fill in the hyphen with something else. Jesus and my good works, Jesus and politics, Jesus and education, Jesus and business, Jesus and Buddha. You can't put anything after a hyphen. If you add to Jesus, you subtract Jesus. His work is finished. When Jesus gives up his spirit after declaring finished, is it not at least conceivable that when he gives up his spirit, he not only gives it up to the Father, into whose hands he commends himself, is it not conceivable also that he gives up his spirit to the four women, including his mother, and to the beloved disciple at the cross, that in his dying breath now, this word, these seven words, from the, my God, my God, why, all the way through to the, to the childlike embrace of the Father's hands, that this spirit now is upon the witnesses to, at, the, at the cross, just as in on the third day, his spirit will be in Mary, as she, seeing the risen Jesus, now runs to the disciples and becomes the first preacher of the resurrection. I have seen the Lord. And this same spirit, which Jesus later that first Easter Sunday gives to his disciples in a locked room and then gives the next week as well to Thomas, who was not there the first time around. The same spirit which would come uh, uh, 40, 50 days later on Pentecost to give tongues so that the people of God might preach in every foreign tongue of the people gathered in Jerusalem. Jesus gives up his spirit, not simply to the Father, to be removed from us, but he gives up his spirit so that the Holy Spirit might be uh, the presence of God in us, with us and for us. So these are the seven words of Jesus in, uh, in a particular order today, but, but there is definitely uh, room to, to lay these out side by side. And again, these words are not simply to ponder, look upon, but these are words in which we can now pray in the company of Jesus, uh, pray with him in his dying woes. And in this way, dying with Christ, um, we are raised to new life in him as well. We have been baptized into his death and will certainly be united in newness of life in a resurrection like his. Thank you for the last several weeks as we looked at the prayers of Jesus. Starting next Thursday, we're going to begin a series on the epistles of Peter. We're going to take this dear disciple who, uh, having denied Jesus, needs to be restored. And then uh, we'll, we'll watch him a little bit in the book of Acts as he begins to, to preach Christ and him crucified for the salvation of all who hear. Uh, and then, of course, looking at Peter's two epistles that we have near the end of the New Testament. 
So we'll do that next week. And, uh, and then uh, on Monday, we'll have our Monday Sunday school. And that class continues on the Lament Psalms. We have several more of those to do. So thank you for joining us on Facebook. I'm going to uh, stop the Facebook live stream now, and then we'll jump in with the Zoom chat and check in. God bless you.